All right, guys, so good morning. And um, who would have ever thought that a mouse would be the foundation for one of the most famous monuments in the world today? Today I will be talking about the creation of Disneyland. Um, I have been researching Disneyland myself for 10 plus years and all the history that goes along with it. I am an avid goer and I annual pass holder for over 10 years, um, a monthly visitor, sometimes even weekly visitor. Um, everyone here in this classroom today, according to Google Maps, is sitting 5.2 miles away from Disneyland, so this affects <laughs> all of us today. Um, today I will reveal Walt Disney's inspiration, the obstacles that were faced, and the completion of Disneyland. <laughs> First, I'd like to talk about how Disneyland was thought of and who, was and who inspired the theme park that we know today. Um, Walt Disney has two children. One is adopted and one is his biological child. Both were treated equally and he always spent time, just him and his daughters, on Sunday. They were frequent visitors of a Los Angeles carnival where Walt Disney would sit on the park bench and watch his children go along the, car the carousel. It was that park bench that is inspired today at Disneyland. This is a recreation. This park bench is acknowledged for the concept of Disneyland today. Diane Disney, his daughter, says, when I was growing up, he was always talking about doing an amusement park. <coughs> How do I go back? Okay, you have to right click and then go up to previous. This is actually the concept art that Walt Disney drew up in 1952. It's kind of blurry on the screen, I do apologize, but if you guys see right here, you can see the castle and everything. Can you guys recognize anything? The engines, yeah. Right. And now California Adventure is like over here. And there's the railroad. Walt Disney was a huge advocate of railroads, and this is a scale of five eighths to an actual one. Um, once he had the ideas drawn up and talked to the owner of the carnival, he sent his animators back east to basically any sort of carnival to pick, <coughs> draw, and bring back because he wanted to perfect his dream. Um, according to Mice Chat, which is Disney's number one source, uh, Walt Disney nurtured the idea of an amusement park since the 30s. By 1952, he had sketched out the project but his ever so cautious brother just thought of it as another one of Walt's screwy ideas and refused to invest $10,000 of the Burbank studio money. Have any of you guys had any dreams that have been looked down upon because of money? I know I have. I wanted to go to the Art Institute and I couldn't because of money because everyone looked down on it. I'm the only one? Yeah. Right? It yeah. sucks, right? So, yeah. Do you guys have any where you like to go and think? because mine happens to be Disneyland. But um, it's common, and Walt was just like you and I, just with the, the bigger pocket. <laughs> um, with Walt's Disney's dreams and inspirations that we just talked about, it did come some obstacles and setbacks for him. I could never convince the financiers that Disneyland was feasible because dreams offer too little collateral. Walt Disney fought and fought and fought to get Disneyland financed. It was a total of $17.5 million to have Disneyland completed. He took the drawing that we just saw to the bank to actually get it financed and everyone laughed at him. Um, it took a year to complete Disneyland. The construction began on July 21st, 1954. Um, there was five lands that was proposed, which is Main Street, which is actually con um, picked apart different pieces of America to bring. There was Fantasyland, which is still there, which is saying that um, follow your dreams and everything will come true. Frontierland, Old West, Adventureland, to give hope, and Tomorrowland, the leading of tomorrow's future. So after everything was said and done, and most of the obstacles were overcame, Disneyland finally opened their gates a year later. This is Walt talking about Disneyland. We're approaching Anaheim now. Sorry. Almost there. Turn right at the next corner, Harbor Boulevard, and here we are at Disneyland. 
This location, by the way, was chosen with the aid of traffic experts as the most accessible spot in Southern California. Right. And our visitors will have no parking problem. We will have <laughs> car. Our first job was to clear these 160 acres, and then the contouring began. And incidentally, to create the rolling hills, mountains, and over two miles of lake and river beds, we've already moved over 300,000 cubic yards of dirt. Of course, construction work has been going on for some time now. Here's the beginning of Main Street, a composite of all the small towns in America at the turn of the century. Here you can take a ride in the horse car past the old town hall, the opera house, the fire house, and if you stay on to the end of the line, you will reach the hub of Disneyland where this camera tower now stands. So this is definitely an interesting video, and I definitely recommend it for you guys to watch the whole thing. This was actually a broadcast that Walt Disney did on YouTube. And prior to Disneyland opening, you could watch this on Channel 7. Sorry. Okay. So. Um, like I said, Disneyland opened their gates on July 17, 1955. The entrance and everything was televised. How Walt Disney got some of his money was actually through ABC Channel 7 to televise the whole thing. Celebrities were there, everyone was there. The only thing was, is that it wasn't properly prepared. If you guys actually watched the video, there was, um, the cement was wet, there was a 15 degree um, increase in heat, which didn't um, allow the asphalt to set, so actually women's heels were getting stuck in the cement that day. Yeah, there was a plumber strike also, so a lot of fountains weren't working, and the garden, you saw in the video how the um, plants and everything were dug up, so in order to hurry up and get everything finished, they actually went around and pulled plants and put them, like from different gardens, and put them in the park and put these obnoxious um, name cards with different words on them to try to fool people that they were exotic plants. <laughs> right? So, like I said, it was $17.5 million, $17 million to make Walt Disney's dream come true. And I would like to show you guys Walt's dedication to Disneyland. Do you mind hitting the light? This is video short. Welcome to this happy place. Welcome. Disneyland is your land. Here age relives fond memories of the past. And here youth may savor the challenge and promise of the future. Hold on. This is not the remix. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. Well. <coughs> Look on the background. Look on the background. Look on the background. Just listen. <laughs> so basically what he's saying is Disneyland is meant for to bring joy to everyone across the world. It deals with the pressures in America's face and for tomorrow's dreams. <laughs> And you guys, today I went over Walt Disney's inspirations, obstacles, and the completion of Disneyland. As you can see, Disneyland started as a dream of a man who wanted to bring joy to people all over the world. With determination and dedication, Walt Disney completed his dream that is still thriving some 5.2 miles from where we stand today. Thank you. So Jason, what did you think? Um, I thought it was good, but I think the beginning of um, the better better attention grabber, the rhetorical question, wasn't that strong. But she had a very good purpose statement, and um, I really liked her, her uh, credibility. She mentioned she had over 10 years of experience with Disneyland, that she was an annual member, and that she goes monthly, so I feel like I can really trust her that she knows what she's saying. 
I think it was a good structure. Like she started from the very beginning, like before he had planned just how the the dream came to Disney. So that was really interesting. Oh, she also quoted like quoted a lot of her um, sources. Like she told about the quote from Disney's daughter, from Disney himself, and a lot of stuff for um, other sources. I wasn't too sure about the question she had in the middle about whether we had our dreams stopped by money. Because I think she was flowing very well, but I think it kind of interrupted her um, pace. So. But I thought also, it, also, um, it was good because it helped engage the audience more. I like the visuals because she took advantage of them. It wasn't just like she had words on her PowerPoint. She had pictures that she really went in depth on what they were about. Mostly I like that she didn't read everything off the cards. I felt like she knew what she was talking about. She didn't need to remember everything just from reading it. She could like, bring it up uh, by herself because she was so uh, knowledgeable about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a lot of what you said sounds right to me. I think that you had a very clear topic identification. I think that the attention device was fine. It could have been a little bit more interesting. Um, I thought you had great personal justification, and I like the Google information at the beginning, you know, how close we are. I thought that that kind of, you know, everybody in Southern California thinks of Disneyland as being in their backyard. And when you just say it's 5.2 miles from where we're sitting right now, oh, yeah, it is pretty darn close. So, so I think people get engaged by something like that. Um, a pretty good use of supporting material. Sometimes I think um, uh, you, you've got a little bit more than you can uh, chew in the amount of time that you've got with the video clips. I, you know, some of that might have been abbreviated. A couple of things might have been simplified and maybe just have the quote. On the other hand, you had the quote on the screen at one point, and I'm not sure why we had to have the quote on the screen. You could just say the quote. You don't need to have that. So just a little bit of editing here and there um, on the visuals, I think, would have probably made it flow a little bit more smoothly. I know exactly what Jason's talking about when you ask the question that turns out not to be a rhetorical question, but you're actually waiting for people to respond. It felt like, you know, we kind of hit a, hit a, what would you call it, a pothole in the, in the road. You know, it was like... Uh, what's happening here? You know, and it, it just feels so. That's one of those things that you want to be careful about. Engaging the audience is not a bad thing to do, but you have to be in control of it. You've got to have it planned out, and you've got to you know figure out how you're going to move on. And it just felt a little bit awkward uh, at that particular point. Um, like I said, the first video clip is is a little lengthy, and I know there's a lot of stuff that you want to show in it that makes it interesting. Um, and then the second video clip you had a little bit of technical <coughs> issue with, but it, it ultimately was fine. I don't think you would, should worry about it too much. I thought that you handled it pretty well. You do have a tendency to just lean on the desk and you're kind of sitting there and stop talking to us, so watch that. Uh, remember, you're supposed to be giving the speech, not narrating the show, and that's exactly the kind of thing that gives the impression that you're just narrating the show instead of giving the speech to us. All right, thank you.